So good evening and welcome to our Tuesday evening Buddhist meditation class. My name is Angus Berry and Gen Chodor has asked me to teach this evening's class. I'm one of the teachers here at Kadampa Meditation Center, Florida. I've been teaching for more than 20 years now and very happy to be here this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. So this evening's class, um, our class series is entitled the habits of happy people. So hopefully this accords with our daily life and how we can become happy. It's a very practical class I hope this evening and I'll discuss a little bit more of the details. The format of our class is we begin with something called the liberating prayer and this is um, uh, a beginning practice, a traditional Buddhist beginning practice, preliminary practice, to help us settle our mind and become present here in the moment and get the most from the time we've invested this evening. Interesting side note for me, um, the word prayer has many connotations, um, many meanings maybe from for different people. But the literal translation of the word prayer from Tibetan is wish path. So it's holding a wish, holding a um, happy, virtuous wish. And if we listen to the words, it's an expression of appreciation for the teachings that we, re we, we receive from Buddha Shakyamuni. So all the teachings we have at Kadampa Meditation Center Florida ultimately come from Buddha. This wonderful thing, an unbroken lineage going back two and a half, more than two and a half thousand years. Wonderful. And then we have a breathing meditation. So the, after these brief prayers, we have breathing meditation, and that allows us to settle and accomplish some some inner peace, so we can enjoy our evening class. And then we have a teaching. The teaching explains um, Buddha's advice. Buddha's view on how to accomplish lasting happiness. Wonderful. And then we conclude with a final meditation on the actual teaching to help us take these to take our understanding to heart and then um, set us up to put these teachings into practice and then experience the results. So hopefully you're um, going to enjoy a very relaxing and inspiring evening. So when we begin meditation, um, we can uh, try to set our environment, our, our local environment, maybe you're not in a, a temple like this, but um, set our environment up. And in our mind, imagine that we're in a temple. So um, uh, turning off any objects of distraction setting aside any distractions and becoming present here in the moment. So we will begin with liberating prayer. Supreme purifying nectar and your 
so we can check our posture, making sure we're comfortable for the next few minutes. Place our hands in our lap if we wish and gently close our eyes to help us let go of any visual distractions. But we should feel free to open our eyes at any time we wish. And then to help us let go of mental distractions. And to help us set good motivation. We can make a decision for ourselves, if we wish, that this is our time to meditate. And consider that our effort to meditate benefits everyone, including ourselves. And we can use the power of our imagination to help us let go any mental busyness or momentum we may have accumulated already today by simply imagining that the world outside of our room, the entire world outside of our room, along with any worries, concerns, or responsibilities simply dissolves away into an imaginary light and vanishes completely, leaving nothing remaining like the end, like the end of the experience of a dream. with the feeling in our heart of letting go. Feeling our attention gathering inwards. Our mental focus gathering inwards. We can imagine that everything around us, the entire contents of our room and everything outside of our body, simply dissolves away and vanishes completely, leaving just our body remaining. Briefly, we can become aware and conscious of the feelings and sensations in our body. Paying particular attention to any points of physical stress or tension we're carrying. Any tense muscles, each time we breathe out, we can imagine releasing and breathing out any tension we find. And feeling all our muscles relaxing.
feeling our whole body relaxing. And we can imagine that our body itself, our body we identify with so closely for our sense of self, also simply dissolves away and vanishes completely, leaving just our mind remaining. our mind, our mental consciousness to focus gently but single-pointedly, simply observing the sensation of our breath. Mm. Without controlling, Simply observing the cool sensation as we breathe in. And the warm sensation as we breathe out. And if our mind wanders, follows a thought, we can simply let that go as soon as we become aware and return our attention to our breath, following it until our mind settles. Enjoying the feeling of peace that arises.
having cultivated some relaxed concentration. We can relax our concentration. and rise from our initial meditation. And when we feel ready, we can open our eyes. So the habits of happy people. That's ultimately what Buddha gave 84,000 teachings on. And uh, this evening's particular class will have a little bit of a summary, actually, of, of the essence of some of those methods on, on how to become happy. So as you can see, I have uh, three books with me this evening. Um, so this class in particular is coming from uh, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. This is a um, teaching given by a Buddhist monk, Shantideva, in the 7th century, an Indian Buddhist monk. And um, it has particular resonance here in Florida. Uh, the, the words were translated from Tibetan under Venerable Geshe-la's guidance, Geshe Kelsen Gatsu, many of you know him, you see his picture here on the shrine. Um, uh, I had the good fortune actually to see some of the pechas, which is a um, palm frond uh, that it is written on in Tibetan. And they were being returned to Geshe-la so this is a good few years ago now. This is maybe 15 years ago. And um, even then we were doing remote work. Um, we didn't have online classes. Uh, well, actually we did, but that was audio only. The video wasn't so good then. But um, this, some of this translation work was carried out here in Florida, in Safety Harbor. So wonderful. We have uh, great karma in Florida. So originally there was only um, Meaningful to Behold is commentary. You can see the book here, the paper book here. I'll also be teaching from the e-books. So these two books in particular I wanted to mention before we get started, Modern Buddhism, and then uh, the book How to Transform Your Life. I particularly recommend these both because they are available as free downloads. So we can download these books and we can have them on our phone, um, or we can... Um, you know, buy paper versions if that's what we wish. But these are these are gifts to the world from Geshe Kelsang, and they contain uh, numerous references to Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. This is a um, uh, set of instructions, we could say, presented in the form of a poem on how to achieve the happiness that we wish for. So. We're going to close with this, and I also want to begin with this. I said the happiness that we wish for. That's almost a little bit of an assuming statement to say that. I mean, I can assume because we're in a class called the, ha the, the um, uh, Habits of Happy People. I think, yeah, the Habits of Happy People, I get the type exactly correct. <laughs> so I can have some assumption. But if we look in both our own life and in the experience of others. Our entire life's purpose, or the common thread that we can see through our life, is a wish to be happy. And, and we have this wish all the time, even, even in our dreams. Yeah. And we wake up from sleep. And the first thing we wish for is maybe after attending to bodily needs is our favorite beverage. Why? Because it brings us some happiness. It brings us some 
temporary happiness. And if we've been around a while, if we've been hearing Buddha's teachings for a while, this, this, this thought, these words even, may be familiar to us. And therein lies how the danger of how to waste our time if we're not conscious of this wish to be happy. And we're not conscious and awake of where we're looking for happiness. It will cause us to waste our life. And if we simply understand that many of the things that we enjoy are simply temporary happiness, then honestly we can enjoy those more than before. <laughs> it sounds a little ironic. And some people, they maybe associate Buddhism with uh, sort of some kind of austerity, um, giving things up. Buddhists do give things up. We give up the cause of suffering, the cause of problems. And then what we contemplate, practice, make our way of thinking are the causes of happiness. So it's very simple. And scientific. In both of these books, Keshla begins saying, these are scientific methods. I had to explain this in a presentation uh, today. This is a, it was a business presentation. Science means repeatable. One of the aspects of science means repeatable. Repeatable outcomes. So... Simply putting these teachings into practice, we can expect results. Not grasping at results, but simply following the instructions. I love the way Geshe I said this once in, in a teaching I heard him say, exactly instruction following. And those are his exact words. And it really made me think, exactly instruction following. And it, maybe, it always makes me think about my practice. My practice of putting these teachings into practice. If I follow the instructions, and, and why, oh, maybe I'll just cherry pick. So that's what we do initially. We, we, we have problems we wish to solve. If I could just change this, I definitely would be happier. So if I could just get, get rid of that thing, I'll, I'll call that renunciation for now, or, or um, moving away from something like that. But gradually... Our daily life becomes our spiritual life. This is very much Kadampa way. Uh, again, Ladekion, our most senior teacher, uh, loves to say, loves her to say it's many times in teachings, uh, the union of Kadam Dharma and daily life. Kadam Dharma is the teachings of Jason Karpa, or the doctrine, the, the summary of Buddha's teachings by Jason Karpa, we can say in this context and our daily life. So, we don't have our spiritual life there and our daily life there. The two begin to merge. The things that rub us the wrong way in our daily life start to transform. Hence the book, Transform Your Life. That difficult person, strangely enough, starts to become precious to us because without them, we can't perfect our patience. One of the Bodhisattva's perfections. One of the Bodhisattva's six perfections. So there'll be more about that in subsequent classes, the six perfections. And Chodor will teach about that. A Bodhisattva means being bound for enlightenment. So we put these teachings into practice. We are headed for enlightenment. And what is enlightenment? Permanent and lasting happiness, unlike the temporary happiness that we normally experience. So it's very important to consider this when we hear Buddha's teachings, to set a, con a context in which we listen to Buddha's teachings. And make it personal, make it about us and the people around us. How do I apply these teachings? And then every day, every part of our day, is our spiritual life. It was wonderful. So I wanted to begin 
by reading a little bit about the definition of happiness. So I had this conversation recently with a colleague, and it's quite interesting. Um, very educated person as well. Um, we started talking about, well, what is the cause of happiness? Um, and they, they know I'm a Buddhist practitioner, teacher, and so had some questions. And it's quite difficult for many people to define, like, well, what is happiness? Where does it even come from? These are some of the most simple things that we know from Buddhist teachings. Nothing arises without a cause. Things don't just fall from the sky. So actions and their effects, karma, certain actions will lead to happiness. So it makes sense that we would cultivate those actions, primarily mental actions. And then other actions lead to suffering, problems, unhappiness. So we would abandon those actions, again, primarily those mental actions. So one definition, and we've been looking at this quite a bit on, in our Monday evening classes, um, one definition to help us understand what happiness is, is that a true source of happiness would never give rise to suffering. It's very simple. Very easy to understand. It's the hallmark of Jesankarpa's tradition of Kadampa Buddhism. If something is a true source of suffer true source of happiness, it can never give rise to suffering. And then we start to look at the places that we look for happiness. And unfortunately, many of those would give rise to suffering. Take food, for example. If food were a true source of happiness, more food would make us more happy. And we, to counteract that, we have to have phrases, modern fra common phrases, I might say, like moderation in all things. Because if we keep eating, we know what happens. If we just keep eating, we know the consequences of that and how it will affect our health. So not a true source of happiness. So food's a useful one because, well, obviously we wouldn't just abandon food, but we see it for what it is. And if we understand that the foods that we like are simply a temporary cause of happiness, then we can enjoy them for what they are. Very natural. No strange behavior, because we're following the Bodhisattva's path. Enjoy it for what it is. Temporary source of happiness. This too shall pass. <laughs> yeah. So... That phrase I hear thrown around sometimes when people experience difficulties, this too shall pass. Do we ever say that, though, about when we do experience some happiness? Do we ever say, oh, things are going great, so the weather's lovely. Um, I have some of my most cherished friends. I'm going to go for a socially distanced, fresh air walk in the lovely weather. But this too shall pass. That would seem a little unusual. But if we understand that even our moments of happiness can be fleeting, again, we'll enjoy them more for what they are, rather than worrying about what we've seen in the news or other things. We can just be present in the moment and enjoy it. This is a very important foundation for a happy life. And if we're going to follow the spiritual path, one of the most important things is that we enjoy it. Because again, if we look at our life and we are honest with ourselves, one of the side effects of meditation is, is the personal honesty that goes with it. When we meditate and we meditate in our own heart, it's just us. And what is wisdom, maybe if we're meditating on Dharma. But we get that settled feeling and, and we can see things for what they are. So,
And this actually comes from training in actual bodhicitta. So bodhicitta, I'm going to define a little bit what that, what that wish is, what that mind is. So I'm going to alternate between e-books and paper books uh, so I can give page numbers. And uh, I'm, I'm an, I tend to be an e-book reader and uh, I study with e-books and I hear page numbers quoted, so I'll give titles as well. So this section is training in actual bodhicitta if you're searching for that. And page 85 if you have a paper book. Here Geshla says in modern Buddhism, the happiness that we normally experience through having a good job, sorry, in good conditions, such as a good reputation, a good position, a good job, good relationships, seeing attractive forms, hearing good news or beautiful music, eating, drinking and sex is not real happiness but changing suffering, a reduction in our previous suffering. There's no wasted words in this book, and every word's been poured over very carefully with great thought. So I've just listed, unfortunately, for how many of us, many people have spent time, a whole list of things that people believe are a source of happiness and spend a great deal of time and effort trying to acquire, trying to arrange our life so we have these experiences. Good reputation, good position, good job, good relationships, seeing attractive forms, hearing good news, beautiful music, eating, drinking and sex. But they're not real happiness, they're changing suffering. A reduction of our previous suffering. So how is that? Hearing good news is a reduction of hearing negative news, negativity external that appears to be external to our mind. Drinking, for example, it's a reduction of thirst. Gershla goes on to say, out of ignorance, however, ignorance meaning a misunderstanding, we believe that only these things bring real happiness. And because of this, we never wish we never wish to attain real happiness, the pure and everlasting happiness of liberation and enlightenment, even for our own benefit. We are always searching for happiness in this impure life of samsara. Hmm. Samsara is a word we're going to look at, again, familiar if you've been um, to classes. We're going to look at samsara and, and one of Geshla's recent sort of clarifications of the word samsara in, in a few minutes. But we can say cyclic existence because that cycle, um, it goes beyond, beyond this life. That cycle of looking for happiness, finding it a little bit, but it turns into suffering. So looking for more happiness, it's almost like, almost like an addiction. It's just cyclic existence and even in our emotional life someone uh, is unkind to us immediately a sense of self arises and 